This is David Harvey, and you're listening to the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a podcast that looks at capitalism through a Marxist lens. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I start my podcast uh, today uh, with a certain date, which is uh, June 14th, uh, 1944. At that time, I was uh, nearly nine years old. And uh, on the night of uh, June 14th, I became acquainted with something called doodlebugs. Uh, A week before uh, June 14th, uh, the D-Day invasion of Normandy had occurred, and the place where I lived on that night was full of aircraft flying, and we knew something was up uh, because uh, obviously it was sortie after sortie after sortie Mm. of aircraft flying over, presumably to to drop bombs on the German positions and so on. And I remember it in particular because I was sort of watching the night sky and uh, most of the planes were flying without lights. And suddenly there was a big flash and a bang and I thought there was some explosion and I didn't know what it was. We thought there was something happened. Uh, But it turned out it was two planes that collided and that's always in my memory. But June 14th was very different because there was noise in the sky. And it was a peculiar noise in the sky. It was rather like a very old motor, chug, 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 chugging its way. And when we looked out the window, we saw these, what seemed to me at the time, sort of huge black beetles coming across the sky, spitting fire as they came. And we were watching at this. And at first, I think we all thought it had something to do with the D-Day invasion. And then I, my mother suddenly realized that they may be coming for us. So it was that point that I was sort of picked up and I was pushed downstairs and thrown under the stairway because uh, under the stairs was the safest place to be in the case of bombs dropping. Uh, this was the first rocket attack coming uh, from the Germans uh, towards London. Uh, we were in between uh, Germany and London, and so they were coming over our head. And there was wave after wave of these doodlebugs coming. Now, what we soon learned uh, was that all the time the engine was going, there was nothing to worry about. So when the things were going chug, chug, chug across the sky, we would just later on just stand and watch them or whatever, or just get used to them going. The, the, the thing was that as soon as they ran out of uh, fuel, uh, they would crash. And when they crashed, of course, they exploded. So the first wave then of bo- doodlebugs was this kind. But I was very, very frightened uh, by this. And to me, therefore, it's indelibly in my uh, condition, if you like, to to, to sort of think about uh, this. And this has always remained with me. And right now I'm watching what is going on in the Ukraine and I'm watching the rocket attacks. And soon after the doodlebugs, about a month later, we started to get what were called V2s, which were, were, uh, in, you know, which were rockets. The doodlebugs were sort of, I don't know, bomb engines sort of flying across the sky. The rocket attacks came about a month or so later, the V2, and uh, about three or 4,000 people, I think, died in Britain from the rocket attacks. And uh, I never saw the rocket attacks, and we never heard them, of course, and most of them did not come over us so that we wouldn't see them. They just were up in the atmosphere and then landed uh, mainly in and around uh, London. So this was my early early experience, and and, and it stayed with me because I, I always think when I see sites such as what's going on in Ukraine, I think, what's happening to the kids there? How many kids nine year old? And what effect is going to have on them? Because this experience was kind of a little traumatic experience in my own life, which played a very significant way in which I, I react to all the visual images which we're now getting of the destruction uh, in, U- in Ukraine. And I think it's, uh, however, images which actually transfer. So one of the things that is bothering me right now is while everybody is decrying what is happening in the, U- in the Ukraine and is going on and on and on about Putin and so on, and of course I share all of that, those opinions. But then I remember uh, the, 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 the attack upon Bag- Bag- Baghdad and, and the opening of the Iraq war. Uh, back in uh, in two thousand and three, 
And, and at that time, I, I remember I had taken off. I was visiting Madrid, and I, I, I took off uh, in the late afternoon from New York, and I arrived in Madrid the next morning. And during that period, war broke out. The, the invasion of Iraq had, had begun. And, of course, the invasion was preceded by this rocket attack upon, uh, upon Baghdad. And we saw it all on television. There were these red flashes and blue flashes and green flashes and so on. And, and we were assured that these, these were only military targets which were being hit. But we now know that, of course, that was not the case. And even if it was only military targets being hit, I was thinking, how, how, what's happening to the kids? How, how is it affecting them? How terrifying it might be. And I went back to that moment where I was being terrified by the doodlebugs and, 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 and thinking to myself, well, you know, this is very minuscule compared to what is going on in Baghdad, which in some ways is minuscule in relationship to what is happening in, U in Ukraine. Except that while we're all going on about how dreadful it is of what Putin, why would Putin do this, uh, of course, it was equally dreadful that Bush did that uh, to Baghdad. And, and it, as we now know, it was all based on a, a complete lie about him having weapons of mass destruction and, and, and all the rest of it. And, and in the same way, we can kind of say, what is Putin trying to do? He's trying to impose upon uh, Iraq a certain kind of way of living and everything which is consistent uh, with his ideas about the universe. What did we do in Iraq? We, 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 the coalition authority that took power in the wake of, uh, of Saddam's defeat and, and, and death, the, 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 what, what, took, what, what happened there is that they effectively prescribed a neoliberal constitutional order. Uh, Bremer, who took over the coalition uh, authority, uh, insisted that all, all public enterprises be privatized, that all, everything should be open to foreign investment, that there should be no barriers whatsoever to the transmission of profits from profit of foreign investment abroad, and, 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 and also there was certain uh, re uh, requirements of, of labor, about labor organization and so on. So in, in effect, while, I, while I'm sitting here and I'm, 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 I'm listening to all this stuff about how, I, how much we should you know, decry what Putin is doing and all the rest of it, I, I kind of think the same people who actually were behind what happened uh, in Iraq are now pretending they're the good guys. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, they're all bad guys. And we'd have to start to think about how to, how to deal with these bad guys and what this bad guy stuff is all about. And it is bad guys on both sides. Now, this brings me to one, I think, really interesting kind of little sidebar on this. The V-2 rockets that landed on Britain were designed and, and, and developed in Germany in a very, very scientific way. And the scientific power behind them and the technological knowledge behind them was very, very significant. So what happened after the end of World War II? All of the German scientists were picked up from Germany and not, you know, attacked for having engaged in war crimes or anything of that kind. No, they were picked up and brought to the United States and they formed... Uh, NASA and the whole kind of rocket science aspect of, 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 of U.S. Uh, military engineering. And the head of this program was none other than Werner von Braun, who is the famous leader of the whole NASA effort to develop uh, international rocketry science and ballistic missiles and all, all the rest of it. So you then kind of say, okay, uh, there is a certain continuity between this German effort to produce the V2s, which uh, was part of uh, my, my upbringing, uh, and uh, the whole kind of subsequent development of uh, rocket science in, in the United States, which was about military expenditures, which then, of course, then immediately kind of brings us to the question of why is it that World War II which was the center of a lot of technological innovation, and significant innovation, World War II uh, led into uh, the idea that there should be no giving up on technological science uh, being applied to, to military ends. And this leads me immediately to one of the reflections which I've 
uh, thought about uh, and, and occasionally mentioned in these podcasts, which is that what, what's the role of military expenditures? And what's the role of militarization? What's the role of the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower described it back in the sort of 1950s? What is the role of the military industrial complex in uh, contemporary capitalism in the United States? And I want, I want to argue that in the same way that uh, uh, wasteful expenditures on all sorts of crazy sort of uh, real estate ventures and, and built environments and so on, are one of the ways in which surplus gets absorbed. So military expenditures are one of the ways in which surplus can get absorbed. And a large quantity of surplus, which is very difficult to absorb right now because there's so much of it, large quantities of surplus are being absorbed in military expenditures. And so in a funny kind of way, uh, the military expenditures, which the United States has developed over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, those military expenditures uh, have finally found a use. That is, their use value is they can be sent to Ukraine and so you can you know, get the stingers and the, all the other things you know, going there, the military equipment which is, which is going there. They've got, actually got a use. But even if they don't have a use, then the, the, their use is that they absorb surplus capital in an acceptable way. And this absorption of surplus capital is, for me, a very important problem for an expansionary system. That is, capital is expanding at a compound rate, about 3% per annum, you know, and it gets that 3% becomes larger and larger and larger. So we now ha have a global economy of something like $90 trillion. But then 3% on $90 trillion is going to soon get you to $150 trillion, $200 trillion. So you kind of go, where is all that, where is all that excess money, all of that surplus going to go? And, and that problem has been around since the 1950s, and it has partially been solved uh, by uh, an expansion of military expenditures, because military expenditures uh, have no productive use, they have only a destructive use. And I would like to kind of comment that the destructive use is important, because if you destroy something, then you've got to rebuild it. So the rebuilding of Europe after World War II was a, a terribly important uh, uh, way in which the economy of the 1950s and 1960s was revitalized. Uh, and we've seen examples of, uh, you know, earthquake destruction and so on, which actually creates the possibility for new employment and rebuilding and all the rest of it, so that surplus absorption is, a, is one of the big themes in capitalist political economy, which is not really given enough uh, concern. And this form of surplus absorption I'm really talking about is the surplus absorption that comes uh, with, military, with military expenditures. Now, this is a, a, a point where I want to make a, some, a very explicit uh, argument about uh, the, the Ukraine history. And the argument is this, that in 1991, we saw the end of the Cold War. Now, the justification for all the military expenditures in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s was always, we've got to keep up with uh, the Soviets. And when the Soviet did the uh, Sputnik, that sent everybody crazy, and so everybody had to get involved in, in space science and doing the getting a man on the moon and all that kind of thing. So Sputnik had a big, big impact. Uh, and then you find what the military industrial complex does is it has a sort of a propaganda arm which generally says there is some military weakness which has to be cured. And it can be a missile gap. It can be a, anything of this kind. And, and, and you start to say that we are vulnerable, uh, we're insecure because uh, we are not in advance of what we think the Soviets are doing. And even if they are or not doing, it doesn't matter. As long as we think they're doing it, it then becomes significant. And the propaganda arm will say, we have evidence that the, the Soviets uh, are developing these kinds of missiles, so we've got to develop another kind of missile defense uh, and, and, and the new kinds of missiles that can get past the defense. These, these are the sorts of issues which then get kind of propagated into the public and they then lead into another bout of uh, massive expenditures 
uh, on, on, on armaments and, and, mili- and, and, and the military. Now, when the Cold War ended, it seemed as if the reason for these uh, military expenditures had gone away, right? The, 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 the enemy had, had collapsed. The, the argument that we've got to keep the Soviets in there, and, and in fact, in part, they had collapsed as a result of, of an arms race. And this was kind of another very interesting aspect of the military expenditures story. The one sector of government which doesn't experience austerity or rarely experiences austerity is the military budget. So even though there may be a demand that everybody should save and everybody should engage in austerity and there's less money for social expenditures, less money for education, uh, less money for health care, less money for uh, you know, public investments, all those kinds of things, the one thing they always say is set one side is saying that is not true. We cannot have less money for military expenditures because that will put our, uh, ourselves at risk. Now, this, So this argument becomes very significant, and it's significant particularly at times of recession. Now, in 1982, there was a serious... 1980-82, there was what we call the Reagan recession, because all of the inflation of the 1970s was a problem. Paul Volcker had raised interest rates. There was a recession on. It was very... And, and the answer to the recession, the Republicans said, and Reagan said, is... So to try to shrink, you know, public expenditures, that, that that's the way out of it, except for uh, military expenditures. And so what, what Reagan did was to engage in something which subsequently became called uh, military Keynesianism. That is, he borrowed money like crazy to spend like crazy on, 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 on defense. And he did so very overtly in relationship to the Soviets. And one of his plans was, and maybe it's, this may have been significant in what happened, one of his plans was to essentially try to bankrupt the Soviets because the Soviets could not be able, would not be able to keep up with the massive ex- expansion of expenditures in, on military uh, that uh, Reagan uh, set in motion. Now, you ask yourself, where is the military-industrial complex located? You say, where are all of the uh, corporations? Where's all, all of them? The, uh, now, there are two aspects to this. One is the, the military uh, establishments, the military camps the, and, 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 and the so on, which, which are very significant now in the economies of local places. Now, what happens in, in Congress is that you bid, if you can, to get uh, a military establishment in your state. And once you've got it, you protect it no end. And when there is a proposal maybe to close some, some military expenditures, some military uh, camps, all hell breaks lo- loose lo- locally. That's the end of our economy because that's the heart of our economy. And in Congress, everybody gets together and says, no, you can't, you, you can't do that. So it actually turns out to be very difficult indeed. To, to, to close down uh, the, the, the military establishments and the military camps in the different states and in the different localities. Everybody fights like crazy to, 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 to keep them. Uh, they, they, at some point or other, there was, the, the, there was a commission to try to close down some, and I think they managed to close down three relatively small establishments because of the political resistance to it. So there's a vested interest, therefore, in keeping a very large military establishment in place uh, for that reason. The second part is, of course, the the suppliers of of research and military equipment. You know, Lockheed Lockheed Douglas, uh, Boeing, uh, uh, and and, and McDonnell Douglas, and, and, and Lockheed, and Boeing, and all of those kinds of corporations. Now, if you look at where these establishments are located, you find they're actually located in a big sort of arc, which sort of starts off very gently in sort of Maryland and Virginia, goes big time through the Carolinas, goes into Texas, ends up in, in, in Los Angeles, and then goes up, of course, to Boeing and, and Seattle. So there's a big arc of, 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 of military-minded corporations and that big arc, interestingly enough, when you look at who voted for Reagan in the 1980 election, you find this is people in that big arc. 
So there he is, kind of paying them back, as it were, by saying, okay, we're now going to, everywhere else is going to suffer austerity and so on, but you lot are going to do okay because we're going to expand military expenditures like crazy. And, and, and so that arc did extremely well in the crisis of 1982, and the high unemployment rate did not hit those places. And of course, this was largely in the Sun Belt. It was not in the Rust Belt. So you, 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 you find that, 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 that the military ex- arm of government expenditures has a, political, has a political use in those two senses. So the end of the Cold War in 1991, finally the whole thing is over. Now, at that point, everybody started to say, oh, well, now's a chance for a peace dividend. We don't, we don't need all these expenditures anymore because the Soviets have collapsed. Russia is diminished in all kinds of ways. Its economy is a shambles. Uh, the, its empire has, has gone. So there's, there's nothing there to be, to be frightened about. Why do we, why do we need why don't we Why don't we collect what in the Clinton regime was called a peace dividend. And where is the peace dividend? We can actually cut back on military expenditures because there is no threat. Now, at that, t- at that point, the, kind of the military establishment got together with uh, the, the neoconservatives and the, and the hawks and started to say, yes, but there's a very serious problem around the world. We have to actually expand military expenditures. And that part of that then took up as saying, well, what are we going to do about NATO? And, and NATO as it w- was, was built to, to try to resist Soviet domination. That was what it was about. And, and NATO no longer had a reason to exist. In fact, you could have disbanded NATO in the 1990s very easily if you wanted to. Instead of which, the Hawks and the military-industrial establishment persuaded uh, not only that there should be no peace dividend and you should keep on doing the research and maintain the military establishments all around the country and, and abroad, that all of that apparatus should be maintained just in case. But not only that, but that, but that NATO would expand. So we get this kind of push to try to bring in all of those states which had been part of the Soviet bloc into NATO. So we get this urge and push to expand NATO. And this was, in some ways, a, a crazy idea to expand it at a particular moment when Russia was on its knees. Russia had a, a collapsed economy. Uh, life expectancy in Russia was in decline. The U.S. and the International Monetary Fund was telling Russia that they had to go through shock therapy in order to come into uh, the, the, the capitalist world and reap the benefits of, 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 of global capitalism. And there was a kind of a little cute remark made by Boris Kagolitsky, uh, a Russian uh, intellectual, who kind of said, you know, in 1991, we all thought that the arrival of a, a capitalist market economy was going to sort of send us in one way. We all thought, he said, that we were getting on a jet plane to Paris, where the you know, annual income is, I don't know, $50,000 per year. And it, he said it was a bit like we got halfway across where we were traveling to, and the pilot came on and said, welcome to Burkina Faso, which is only has a per capita income of around sort of $2,000 a year. And this was, so, so, the, so uh, what was the Soviet Union is in total shambles, total collapse. It's being humiliated economically absolutely humiliated economically, and, it, and, it, and, it, it, and it's really, really in bad shape during the 1990s. Uh, its monetary system collapsed. Uh, actually, if you traded things in, 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 in Russia in 1992, 93, the trading item was bottles of vodka. So the large corporations that existed traded bottles of vodka. That was their currency rather than rubles because rubles were, were, weren't worth anything. So, so, so the, the, the total economic collapse. Now, when you get a total economic collapse, what does the world do? Uh, the total economic collapse that occurred after World War II was mitigated by a Marshall Plan. That is, the U.S. went in and sort of said, okay, we are going to revive the Japanese and the German economies. Of course, you can say they did that just because they were good people, but no, they were really doing it because that was the only way in which they could defend against communism that they needed to develop vibrant capitalist economies in places like uh, Japan and, and, and West Germany uh, 
uh, in order to, in order to say, well, we have a better kind of world than 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 the commies do. So this was this this was the 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 the, the, the situation that 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 uh, there was no Marshall Plan for the for for Russia. There was in fact a, a, a sort of almost a, a gloating. Because this was a time when people started to talk about the end of history. Everything is over. We have won. And there were people in Russia saying, what do you mean we have won? You have won. And what's happening to us? Well, we're, we're down the chute. We're down and, and nobody is helping us. Absolutely nobody is helping us. And at that very moment that that's going on, militarily, what, what, is, what is the United States and NATO doing? What it's doing is it's expanding its military capacity and expanding it in, in, in a double fashion of, you know, expanding its you know, rocketry and its and all, all, all atomic weaponry and all those kinds of things. At the same time, as it's actually beginning to bring more and more people into NATO. So you expand NATO. And, and, and a lot of people at the time just said, that this is insane. There's a man called... George Kennan. Now, now, George Kennan was a kind of a, 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 a sort of elder statesman, uh, and he was he was the big designer in the 1960s of what was called the containment policy. His approach to the the, 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 the communist threat was to say, "Look, you cannot go against it directly. We we, we cannot risk uh, an interchange of uh, uh, nuclear weapons and all that kind of thing because." Uh, by then, both Russia and China had uh, atomic weaponry. We cannot risk that, so we contain. How do we contain? Well, we contain in two ways. One is we build uh, strong capitalist, pro-capitalist economies around. That is, you do that in Germany, or you allow it to happen in Germany, and you help it happen in Germany, and you help it happen also in Japan, and then you help it happen in South Korea, and you help it happen in Taiwan and Singapore and all the rest of it. In other words, Kennan was into the containment strategy. And he kind of said, we, if, we can, if we can develop strong and vibrant capitalist economies surrounding the Soviets, surrounding China, then the threat of communism is contained. And that's what we do. So he was, he was, no, he was no friend of, 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 of Russia or China. But what Kennan saw in the 1990s was the threat from, from Russia in particular is over. It's over. So, so what, did, what did he say? And I, I have a, a quote from what he said in 1998, which I think is very telling. Uh, he, was, he, he, just, he went to NATO and he gave a speech and he, and he said, look, I'm appalled at what you're doing. Uh, and he said, I think this is the beginning of a new Cold War. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think this, he said, is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anybody else. The expansion of NATO would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. Of course, there is going to be a bad reaction from Russia. And they, the NATO expanders, will then say, we will always told you that that is the way in which the Russians are going to behave. He said, but this is just wrong. In a way, in a way Putin has, has reacted in exactly the way that Kennan suspected would happen if you went ahead with this expansion of NATO and pushed it up to uh, the edges of Russia. And so here now we are in this mess, which is, which is again, very important. I'm not saying this to excuse anything that, that Putin is doing. I'm just simply saying what we have here is the keeping alive of the U.S. capitalist economy through military expenditures, the constant expansion of militarized interests, and the constant uh, expansion of the, of, of, the, of the military budget, research and... Uh, and, and, and new products and all the rest of it, very much tied to the kinds of research which is going on in these establishments. So you, you've got that on the one side. And, and this is, this is uh, uh, actually creating a situation in the world where if people are not on board with this, 
That is, if people are not totally sort of involved inside of this, but are on the outside of it, as Russia and China were, then you're going to get the reaction. And what concerns me is to say, look, we probably need NATO right now to be able to resist these awful things which Putin is up to. But if and when this is over, one of the things we should do is to start to say, is it, hey, it's about time we demilitarize the economy. And it would be so interesting to see how well capital can survive without a demilitarized economy. My view is that demilitarizing the economy would be not only a security threat, but it in part it has been kept alive because demilitarizing the economy will be an economic threat, a serious economic threat. If you, ca if you close down all those military bases in all those places around the country, if you really suck it to, to, to those corporations that are heavily into the, you know, the provisioning of the defense industry, then there'll be serious kind of economic uh, rambunctions coming out of that. Of course, the argument about the peace dividend was, well, we've got all that money. It's all going into you know, military expenditures. Why can't we put it into building better hospitals, building better schools, building better uh, social fabric? Why can't we do it that way? Yes, indeed, we could use this, the, 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 the peace dividend that way if, if, if it was possible. But the trouble is that there are strong, strong vested interests in favor of perpetuating militarism, in favor of perpetuating defense, in favor of perpetuating all of the mess that has actually led into the current version of the mess. Uh, and is that the way we want the future to be? I want to argue as part of an anti-capitalist strategy that we should have very much in mind the idea of involving ourselves strongly in a defeat, in, in, a, in a peace movement. The peace movement back in February the 15th, 2003, about 15 million people came out on the streets of the major cities to say, we, want, we don't want war. I don't believe the people in the Ukraine want war. I don't believe the people in Russia want war. I don't believe the people in Europe want war. The people in the United States don't want war. None of us wants war. And yet here we are, close to war. Thank you for joining me today. You've been listening to David Harvey's Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a Democracy at Work production. A special thank you to the wonderful Patreon community for supporting this project.